So welcome everyone to the Industry Solutions New Adventures in Online Safety Tools breakout session. My name is Andrew Zak, and I'm the Policy Manager here at FOSI, and I'm thrilled to be moderating this panel today. This year, the theme of our overall conference is recovery and renewal, so that's the lens we'll be applying to the discussion here today. In this conversation, we'll hear from industry leaders about their recent innovative and strategic advancements in keeping kids safe online. I'll ask about parental controls, safety by design, developing products for children and families, digital literacy and educational efforts, major threats, and future predictions for family online safety. Again, please feel free to use the chat function at the right of your screen to introduce yourselves, where you're attending from today, and to ask questions of any of the panelists or the panel as a whole. We are reserving time at the end of the discussion to answer audience questions, and I will also try to incorporate some throughout our conversation. I'm so pleased to welcome today some longtime FOSI members, a new member company, and another industry leader that we work closely with. I'll let each of them a minute or two to introduce themselves, and then we'll get into it. So how about we start with Tom first? Great, thanks. My name is Tom Lee. I'm the CISO for Mattel. Uh, you know, Mattel's been around for a long time. We had our 75th birthday uh, last year, and I look after uh, privacy and security um, for the company. But in addition to that, I'm also looking at the privacy and security protection for our workers, our supply chain, which has been very relevant the last a couple of years. And then of course, most importantly, you know, our consumer data. Everything that FOSI stands for and all of the research and all of the topics is completely relevant to our entire portfolio. So I'm really pleased to be here and I look forward to the session. Thanks, how about Chanta? Hi everyone, my name is Shanta Arul. I'm the Director for Technology and Innovation Public Policy at Netflix. Um, I'm speaking to you live from Singapore. It's good to be here and thanks for C um, for organizing this event. Um, it's a really important conversation. Netflix is an entertainment service. Uh, we're subscription only, no ads, and we really focus on professionally developed content, um, films, TV series, documentaries, and we have an important relationship with parents who are our members. Um, you know, they make a choice every month to pay a subscription for our service. And so we are really invested in making sure that we deliver an experience to them that they expect um, that's appropriate for their themselves and their families. Um, and we're, I'm excited to share more about our suite of parental control tools and the things that we're doing in this space, um, you know, to raise awareness, education about uh, how to have a great experience online um, on Netflix. Excellent. Thank you. Ryan? Uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, hi, I'm Ryan Tuholm, the CTO at Aura, um, a heading up our product engineering and uh, security groups, as well as a parent of four-year-old uh, twin boys. So uh, a lot of what's here hits uh, home to me right about now as they're starting to get onto their iPads. Um, Aura, not a household name yet, uh, we will be soon. Um, we've, uh, you know, taken on this problem. Uh, it started from this, this idea that uh, every seven seconds, roughly, uh, someone's a victim of identity theft or otherwise other online fraud. Um, and generally consumers don't know how to protect themselves. They know they need something, but they know it's also like an incredibly complex uh, world to navigate with lots of solutions that span across many, many different surface areas to the point that it just becomes too much of a hassle to protect yourselves. It's just too many places you have to go worry about this. So um, we, we took on this mission of making the internet just safer for everyone. Um, and we want people to live their lives online and offline with peace of mind, knowing that their data will be private and protected, that um, their finances will be uh, sort of protected and their children will be protected as they navigate a sort of increasingly complex online world. Um, we try to bring together a number of solutions into a, a, a all-in-one, a sort of holistic across the board solution. So um, our customers, um, you know, whether they be individuals or families can spend their time uh, with their families rather than spending their time worrying about how to protect themselves from other, you know, crime and, and financial loss. Um, so for me, I'm so, you know, again, I mentioned my children I'm, as a father, uh, a particularly father of uh, folks who are nascent into this digital world, really excited to be here and, and help uh, uh, in this uh, conversation. Thank you so much. Yes, we love taking both the personal experience as well as the professional experience from all our panelists. And again, Shanta, thank you for the time zone 
uh, participation here today. Extra appreciated. And finally, Marco. Thanks, Andrew. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Marco Leal. I'm uh, Vice President of Worldwide Products at Smith Micro. Um, uh, you've probably never heard of us, but if you're a customer of one of any of the major tier one carriers in the US, you're probably using one of our platforms and you don't even know about it. Um, uh, one, one of the, 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 the products, uh, one of the uh, platforms and solutions we provide to carriers in the US is exactly the, the technology to enable them to provide parental controls to, to their subscribers. Um, so we, uh, just across the tier ones uh, in the US, we have millions of customers using our products, but also have uh, carrier customers across um, Europe and the Middle East. Um, Smith Micro continues to, to, to invest uh, heavily into the uh, into into this area. It's it's a market that's been uh, gr growing immensely for them for the company over the past uh, the past few years, and basically. Um, how what we're doing is we're trying to help uh, parents uh, pretty much like uh, ryan was just describing manage all the different ways that their children can have access to to online content and help parents whether a, the, the children are using their mobile devices outside the home that their gaming console at home or some other device we try to make it really simple for them to get some insight into what their children uh, are doing and be able to set some um, uh, some guidelines or some screen time screen time rules for um, uh, for their for their children. Uh, obviously, everything that uh, Fossi does is is really relevant to us. All the the research helps inform uh, a lot of the decisions uh, we make, and we, we see this market uh, and the way that even that parents perceive this as continuously evolving. So having these discussions and being part of these uh, discussions is really helpful and insightful for us. So looking forward to a great discussion today. Excellent. Thank you. Well, so clearly we've been introduced to the companies a little bit, but let's dive in. Let's talk about some of the specific features. So for everyone here, what new tools and features have your companies created specifically for children in the last year or so? Ryan, I can jump in first. Yeah, yeah. I'll jump in first. So, um, uh, as I mentioned, you know, we focus a lot of our product surface area on uh, like online threats, financial loss. Uh, in the past year, we've introduced family plans. Um, maybe not super well known, but um, children are huge targets for identity theft and uh, sort of um, uh, reuse of their information because you know adults have varying amounts of sort of credit history, but but children have very little. And so their social security number, if they're in the US, like all that personal information uh, just becomes really highly valuable to targeted threats. So we rolled out a family plan to help protect uh, not just adults, but children. Um, and over the course of the next uh, sort of 12 months, uh, we're leaning pretty heavily into uh, things like we talk about like proactivity and automation. Um, we've all talked about how complex this is for for adults uh, to, to do this on their own, let alone to protect their families. We want to make that as simple as possible, where we can make a decision for you, we'll make a decision for you, and we can automate something, we'll automate for you. Um, an area like that is we're, we're rolling out something based off of a lot of data we gather, anonymous data, thankfully, um, where we can um, actually identify new domain threats before they've been identified as threats. So just based off of the content and the surface area of that domain, see that it's a threat so that you're not worried about these sort of in-between windows when things are a risk. Instead, we'll use the benefits of AI and ML, which are sort of like these hugely burgeoning topics to benefit parents in a way where we'll identify threats before um, they sort of reach that critical threshold of being a threat. Um, there's, there's a lot we're working on it almost all falls in the areas of trying to make things simpler for parents who have this immense task every day of getting their kids off to school and getting them clothed and bathed and fed, particularly in this environment where I can tell you with, again, my, my two boys at school right now, you know, we worry about COVID on a daily basis. We worry about how we're gonna get them home and make sure everyone's safe. Making this simple and making it proactive for, for families so that they don't have to worry about it nearly as much is just basically the underpinnings of our entire sort of product portfolio for the next 12 months. I can jump Andrew. in. Um, and Go ahead, Chanta. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, no, I, I think, you know, the pandemic was a, was obviously a challenging time for everyone. And, you know, for us, it was twofold. Um, I'll, I'll go with the features first and, and really talk about the, the content um, on, on the service. You know, shows and movies are, a really great way for kids to connect to the world. And we've been excited to bring some of the, the great family content 
to families, particularly during this time. And hopefully that's given parents some peace of mind as they've been trying to juggle everybody at home and, and in dealing with all the increased screen time. Um, one thing that we found was that um, people can't travel right now, but they've enjoyed traveling with content and through our content. Um, and, and that's where we've invested more and more in content from around the world. So you have shows like Mighty Little Beam from India or Back to the Outback from Australia that's helped kids pick up bits of culture, um, watch shows from around the world, but also maybe dubbed in their own languages. So we've invested a lot in that part of it. Um, but of course, parental controls are, and you know, just ensuring that kids have um, access to age appropriate content is an important part of, of the work that we have to do. And, and we've had parental controls on our service for some time, um, but we also do a lot of research, consult widely, get feedback from our members on what's working, what can be improved uh, and what their needs are. And what we've found in our research um, is that parents have very different expectations and needs uh, when it comes to entertainment services online, um, whether it's been across countries. Um, Netflix is in 190 countries, so you definitely see differences uh, culturally with parents around the world. But even within a country and in the US, you find that parents have very different expectations. Some parents really um, allow for full independence for their kids to navigate uh, the internet. Some of them see um, the, the internet and entertainment as a stepping so stone for exposure and education. Others are really concerned about um, what their kids are going to be watching online and want to watch with them so that they can have those conversations and have a sense of what's happening. So, so we realize that parents are very different. And when we design parental controls, it really has to factor in those varied needs and expectations. Um, so what we did was, was update our parental controls. One, obviously, to make things more streamlined and easier to use, but also um, to address some of the concerns we were hearing. One, for example, being able to have pin protection for each of the profiles. You have up to five profiles on Netflix. Um, so parents can set individual um, profiles with particular pins. They can filter content in each profiles according to maturity rating levels as well. So that if, you're, if your child is 16 or below, they only get content that's suitable for that age group. Um, we even updated things like disabling autoplay so that parents could also manage whether the next episode automatically shows on screen or or there's a bit of more management of how their kids can watch the content. And so all of these, the, we, we basically have a suite of tools that allow parents to customize the experience according to their values, their expectations, and their needs. Um, and hopefully, especially at a time where screen time has become an increasing part of everyday life, uh, that was helpful um, you know, to experience both the best of, of, of the internet space and also have peace of mind as, as their kids engage on the service. Um, Andrew, you know, uh, at, at Mattel, uh, being a product company, one of the products that we released this year was a, a new Fisher Price Illuminate bassinet. So it's it's a bassinet that uh, you you put your um, your baby in, and it has a lot of intelligence built in. It has a smart sensing system, so it can uh, sense when a, a baby cries and the differences in frequency and volume and the type of crying and the duration. And it also has motion sensors uh, as well. So, you know, kind of like your ring light, uh, as the parent's walking up to the bassinet, it kind of lights the path for you. And the bassinet can rock and vibrate and, and play sounds. So thinking about that from a product perspective, obviously the product has to be built um, with security and privacy by design, you know, from inception, because the absolute last thing you would want to do is release a product that had, you know, a vulnerability. And so, you know, we took our standard approach around uh, security and privacy, where we made the product um, secure uh, as part of its fundamental framework. And it's much easier to build a framework that's secure and build on top of that, rather than the traditional approach we frequently see uh, you know, in, in the marketplace where a product's built first and then security is bolted on. So for example, um, there is a, there's a microphone you know, on the, in the bassinet because it has to listen to the, uh, to the cry of the baby. But the microphone um, doesn't need to send any data uh, out, outside of the bassinet itself, and the processing of the of the of the audio for the cry um, takes a few milliseconds. And after that processing is done, the data is deleted. Um, the the data itself is stored in volatile memory, so it can't persist. So um, we looked at all of the 
possible ways that you know a type of a, a connected product you know could be attacked. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to build good, um, safe, secure, uh, both privacy and security defaults, you know, uh, at inception. And that was the approach we took uh, with with this product. And it should be uh, you know a big hit uh, this season. You know, one other um, aspect of this uh, product was we we brought in uh, sleep experts to help design the different soothing actions. And I think you know one of the themes we hear at FOSI is like every child is unique in their own way. And as it turns out, the same is true with the bassinet as well. You know, some babies um, a little bit of rocking or a little bit of music, and then um, they can go back to sleep. Others require the baby to self-soothe. So you kind of have to let the baby work it out a little bit, uh, and then you play the, the vibrations or the sound. And so a lot of intelligence went in and worked with sleep experts uh, to figure out you know, how babies behave and respond. But I thought that was sort of a, in a microcosm was a unique representation of the theme we hear a lot, which is that every child's unique. And here at Saint Micro, we've been investing a lot over this year, and probably continuing into into the next in our parental controls uh, to try to help parents kind of minimize the interaction with, the, with the, the tools, but still providing them a lot of value. And what what we found out is that even the more uh, technology savvy parents, they still uh, feel overwhelmed by the amount of controls and the different controls across uh, across. They would have some difficulty in figuring out the right thing to do. So what we're trying to do is we mean uh the uh, models to try to understand if we can create for every for every channel platform, if we can create a baseline of what their uh, their behavior is and try to expose that to the way to see this is generically how a child behaves uh, online. Happy with that baseline. Okay, now I can look at what the child does. It deviates from this norm. And if it deviates dramatically, which may indicate that something is wrong. Parents, when they look at the tools, they, they, most of them don't actually want to go every day. They say, What did my child do today? What were the, the, the websites or the apps? How much time did they spend? Most of the parents, they really just want to know, is there something wrong? Is there something that I should be paying attention to and I'm not, uh, not paying the, the, the right attention? So this is the, and this is a really long-term investment that we're doing because it's not, it's, not, um, it's not an easy problem to, to crack. But we hope that we can give that to parents. Hey, here's something that they can like. For example, these were, these were kind of the category of apps or websites that your child was doing, all of a sudden, they started doing all of these sketches that are relatively maybe it's something you want to have a conversation uh, with a child about and then with some talking points. You know, this big transition from the um, what we call rules that are all about the monitoring and all to the values by experience months to understand what's going on so that they can have meaningful conversations with their children. So we've been really investing from a technology standpoint, can we actually build this in the current and we just serve to them what we think might be wrong to help them to have that conversation instead of having to wait every day or every week. Hey, let me look at the report, let me see. It's still, especially when they have to do this across the main difference that their children might be done. Thanks, Marco. I know uh, we heard part of you went in and out a little bit with audio. Maybe it needs a refresh, but I know uh, you, we definitely heard you talking about the sort of transition that parents have gone through from uh, sort of helicopter parents to in pre-pandemic versus you can't look over someone's shoulder all the time. So more values based and teaching kids how to use the devices responsibly. Um, hopefully a quick reset on any uh, audio will help on that. But uh, thank you and sorry about that. Uh, hopefully it will come back strong for the next round. Um, excellent. So I that was all of you touched on some recent pandemic updates. Uh, safety by design, customization. I want to get into all of this. Um, I guess the next part is maybe uh, you talked about, everyone kind of touched on informing product design, uh, how you do that, reaching out to either content experts or extra sleep experts, external people who focus on this and you bring them into the design process. I know Tom talked about building that right from the beginning, safety by design. I don't know if you want to expand on that or if others want to comment on how they 
bring in external experts uh, to consult with the design features, whether it's content, whether it's parental controls, whatever it is uh, related to how you develop products. Yeah, you know, I think bringing in experts is uh, and uh, uh, the collaboration with doctors and scientists is even uh, more important now as we start looking at all of these smart devices, smart ways of using machine learning and AI, and just all of the things that these products can do now, uh, you need uh, to consult um, experts. And that's a, a, a shift um, for us. I mean, we, we ha we've had uh, lots of uh, you know, experts participate in our product development process, but it's, uh, the, today we, we know that it's absolutely necessary. And so, you know, instead of just consulting the experts as part of like the normal product development lifecycle, you know, Mattel is now creating uh, and, and funding, you know, new research, creating uh, new coalitions and, and new groups so that we can benefit from all of um, the experts and then also share that with the industry as well. And so I think that's a shift we're seeing in the industry overall is that uh, you're gonna have you know, more, more experts, experts, the research you know, from FOSI, for example, will inform you know, a lot of our product and design decisions. Excellent, thank you. I think, uh, and Tom, Tom hit on a, a couple of really uh, important points. And I think even broader than experts, it's just bringing in people outside your development cycle the, the diversity of ideas. Um, uh, you, if you look back at the last maybe decade or decade and a half of developments, uh, you can see everyone starts building things with an idea in mind of what they want to deliver, but rarely think about sort of the negative externalities of like what can result from that. And you know, I've lived this life and I'm sure many of us have when you're so, you, you've bought in an idea so much and you've gone through the research and then you go, whether you bring in someone from the outside, a consultant, an expert, whether you just go focus group test it with an external audience and they say, hey, this is great, but what about X, Y, Z? And that just slams you in the forehead and you realize you've created these these opportunities for for malicious use of the thing you wanted to bring like joy to people with. Um, that diversity of thought and, and those uh, the ability to sort of remove those implicit biases only make the product development process stronger. Uh, you know, again, uh, Tom and I live in a similar world talking about security tools and security by design and privacy by design. Um, it, you, those ideas baked in uh, at the forefront take you a long way, but they are only as good as the ideas that you have on ways that it can be co-opted or that it can be exploited. And so the more eyes you have on something, experts, consultants, just everyday users to strengthen that product development process results in a better outcome for everyone because you'll catch as many of those things as you can during the development process. And then you just learn more as you start to see usage and as you start to see the way people take the thing you brought into the world like and how they uh, utilize it then allows you to sort of continue to evolve that product over time. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And it, it's really a multifaceted feedback process, um, you know, as we build these these tools and, and experiences. Um, you know, I, I guess the additional um, piece that, that Ryan had also talked about was just the members and, and your users, right? Um, we have a very member first uh, approach to product design. So we have we work with experts we bring in um you know we have product researchers who would also involve child development psychologists um, but we also want to talk to our members so parents uh kids who are using the service in addition to those expert views to really get to the core of what their needs are and what they expect of a great experience, um, what their concerns are going to be so that all that is factored into the, the, the product experience from the get go. And then it's going to continually improve and iterate over time. So you need to have those feedback channels to keep hearing from your members on what um, needs to be improved and iterated over time. Um, and, and then that validation or the feedback from third party organizations when, when we launched our, our updated parental controls, um, FOSI and other organizations were part of our pre-launch uh, presentations to get a sense of, does this work? Um, do you have any additional feedback for us um, before we go to launch? So I think we've got to be thoughtful about getting feedback across um, different perspectives um, and also just being open to continually improving. Um, the best way, of course, is always to be putting things out and getting that live feedback and then being able to improve it. And so that that's always top of mind for us as well. 
You know, Absolutely. I have one great example of where um, feedback, um, you know, maybe give you a different perspective. So as we know, you know, during the pandemic, um, there's a lot of screen time and that screen time has been a topic that's come up a lot. Well, it turns out that a lot of our consumers in India, um, most houses in India are still one TV households. And so if you have children who are home, you know, 24 hours a day, and the parents are also home and there's only one television that actually can uh, cause you know some tension in the household so it turns out uh, for the indian market you know one of the requests um, to us was to produce more content and we've been producing a lot of tv content working closely you know, with netflix and this has been uh, you know a fantastic development for our customers in that region because now the parents can watch the one TV in the household and the children can go and watch, you know, she you know, or Thomas or any of the new content. So I thought that was a, a good example to share. You know, maybe in the U.S., um, there aren't as many one TV households. But when you try to think how the pandemic may have impacted other regions and other customers, you realize how in our case, we, we produced a lot of content and we felt that, you know, content was a way for parents to engage you know, with their children, you know, during the last two years. Hopefully my audio is better. Let me just uh, add something on, on this topic as well. For example, one thing that's been important for us is actually also understanding not just what our customers, which are usually parents, but they need, but also what how children feel about this um, uh, th these types of um, uh, uh, solution. Without without children's buying, you're never going to get parental controls that actually work well for the family, and 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 that actually help to teach them the things that they need to, to learn to be uh, to be better online citizens. And actually, one of the things that we keep finding out is that, and pretty much this is uh, this is. Um, something that uh, applies to education overall and we actually have um, uh, psychology majors in our cx team to help us understand this is that transparency is the key if you're communicating something to parents uh, you need to be communicating the same thing to children so they need to be on the same page so if you're telling parents say this is how your child is behaving online you should be telling the child the same thing hey, this is how you are behaving on online hey, hey, this is actually how you compare with the average for or what the, the the normal population in your in your group does and this transparency between parents and kids is what really gets children to buy in into being uh, part of a, a parental control uh, platform and actually seeing some of the advantages because they start if they start seeing the same things that the parents of the day they, they they figure out themselves. Okay, this is probably I should either hey, my, my screen time really is too big. I should be doing less, or hey, everyone else is doing a little uh, more than I do. So eh, maybe I can manage a little bit more, and it's no big deal. It's still it's still something that's not out of the ordinary. So th th that's been interesting for us to understand from children how they feel about uh, the the parental control solutions that parents use to to monitor their activity. Excellent. Thank you. That, that's perfect. And we have touched on it a little bit, but I want to maybe ask a little bit more directly. Uh, so at FOSI, we often hear anecdotally, and then our research from last year confirms that parents are overwhelmed with the amount of information available regarding online safety and technology controls. So we've talked a little bit, mentioned a little bit about a one-stop shop or easier controls or controls that parents will actually use. So sort of what best practices can be shared to increase the visibility of such resources what challenges have your companies faced in this regard, uh, whether it's direct communication to parents or uh, design features that relate to parental controls as well? I saw nodding from Shanta at first. All right, I can go. Um, no, I think it, it, you're right. It's it's a very important part of, you know, you have the tools um, and you have these product features, but parents being aware of how to use them is a really important part of, of, of the puzzle. Um, and so we focus a lot on that. It's clearly a concern for everyone from the, the panels we were listening to earlier um, at the conference. Um, and, and we work with organizations around the world. We work with FOSI um, as well as NGOs um, to meet parents where they are and try to help them understand how to use parental control tools. We've done um, checklists for parents on how to set up parental controls on Netflix that could be distributed in schools, uh, social media assets. So there's a lot of different ways that you can 
tell um, the story of how to use parental controls in a more easy, compelling ways. Of course, we also have direct engagement with our members um, through our product. Um, and, and we're really open to partnering with organizations to do more. Um, one thing that I did want to share, since there's been so much conversation about how do you bring all these different parental control tools together, there's just so much on the internet. It's pretty challenging for parents to navigate everything um and, and and one thing that we're working on currently actually in france um, with the french ministry of family and child protection is a one-stop shop and the the ministry is actually putting together this portal um and getting industry players like us and others to contribute resources um, so that it can be that source of education for parents um, to navigate different services online and and i think that's a really great idea um in the the challenges that French parents have expressed to the ministry to get them to come up with this idea is universal um, quite clearly. So, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity for all of us to work together um, and, and, and support initiatives like this to help empower parents to, to navigate this experience and the increasingly complex space that, that they're trying to operate in. If I could yeah. piggyback on what, what Shanta said, I think um, the, 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 best practice and, and you know I think Netflix does this really well is delivering the parental controls, delivering the content oh, messaging like, as simply, simply as possible, as possible in, in plain, plain language. language. Um, um, Shanta, Shanta mentioned um, um, meeting parents, parents where they are, they are right? That's right? That's the key. key. You've got to meet people, people where they are. They are and right? too many, many of our of tools, our tools um, they they leverage really sophisticated technical language and, and, and it, it differs from site to site, from platform to platform, which can make it really overwhelming for parents. Um, one of the things that we're doing uh, on top of uh, just trying to simplify the language we use is um, we've actually started dipping our toes into doing some automation around, um, hey, your kids are using Facebook. Here are recommended settings and in a healthy, you know, in a healthy sort of family relationship, or maybe if your kids are on Facebook, maybe you have access to their account. We actually do some browser based automation because Facebook maybe doesn't make their security settings as simple as they might be able to. We'll do some automation behind the scenes to actually set those on the parents behalf. And we're actually taking steps to do that across places where settings are particularly complicated to say, hey, if you've got the login, we can help you make the best decisions. You don't have to know what they are. We'll give you some plain language about what we're doing, but we'll go through and automate this for you so that once a week, once a month, that whatever cadence is right for your family, you can make sure that the settings that you want for your children are still the settings that are being used in their account. Obviously, as those children get a bit older, they're going to want more of a say in that matter. And I think Marco has talked a bit about that, about that, that having to be a conversation. But if you think about all the various places that uh, your your family's data may go and those various security controls. Um, we're trying to navigate making some of that automated for users and then surface it in plain language. So they can understand the changes that we're making on their behalf. You know, at Mattel, well, one of the things that we realize is that um, we need to uh, not just produce products and content, uh, you know, for children, but we also need to produce product and content for the parents and the caregivers as well, you know, especially during the pandemic. So one of the things that we did was we created a Mattel Playroom. It's um, a new digital resource, you know, for parents uh, and caregivers. The theme of the Playroom is play is never canceled. It doesn't cost anything. It's um, free content and there's new content and experiences that are released um, every week. And it's not just games, you know, there's, there's a mission to inspire um, children, uh, to help development through play, you know, entertain, of course, but there's activities, you know, for the children. There's, uh, for example, craft projects, you know, where we train the trainer, we teach the parents how to uh, how to run this uh, DIY craft project with their children. There's lots of uh, topics um, for everybody, depending on what you're uh, looking for. There's topics around um, how to develop empathy. There's um, content about being race conscious and diversity aware. And so we realize that we don't just want to produce toys and content and games for children, but we really need to enable the parents and the caregivers to um, have those shared experiences or to direct the play and uh, make sure that they or help the kids um, benefit, you know, from all of that play beyond just um, uh, sending them in the, you know, in the room with, with a toy, but actually having directed play 
and all of the, the support that uh, you as a caregiver who may not be um, a professional, you know, how do we train them so that um, they can uh, maximize the play with their children? I really love that example, Tom, because, you know, there's so much concern also about how much time kids spend online um, and, and, you know, really having those offline experiences or finding ways for parents to be able to connect with their kids about what they're watching online is, is uh, you know, something that, that's quite close to, to our hearts as well um, and something that we'd released um, that, that sounds very similar. Um, but for, for Netflix members is the bi-weekly kids email, which is an optional email that we send to parents, giving them a better understanding of their kids' preferences on Netflix, as well as new ways to engage in those interests. So we have things like coloring sheets and activity recommendations to engage with your kids' favorite characters, um, tips for how to use kids' features on Netflix. And it's sort of a lighthearted, fun way, but also keeps parents informed, helps them relate to the kids and what they're watching. You know, there's always a gap with parents and kids about what they're interested in online, but bringing those online experiences somehow offline, um, I, I think is something that, that gives parents peace of mind that it's not always just about, about the online experience. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think more of, of the online experience being part of your everyday life, um, you know, and connecting parents and children is an important part of, of what we can do to help, um, you know, raise awareness and, and, and give people the peace of mind. From our side, we, we have a slightly different challenge because we, we don't take any of our products direct to consumer. Like I said, we, we provide the, our technology and platforms to, to carriers. So most of the work we do is actually focusing on once people are under our experience, how can we make sure that parents are, are doing the, 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 the right thing? So what we've been trying uh, to do, and that's what we offer right now is, again, Configuring parental controls is his hard work. So we want to make it as simple as possible for parents and we want them to immediately be able to make solutions. If they can, if they want to actually go into the details, it's always there for them. But um, we want them to be able to say, hey, my this is the, the age of my child or hey, my child's a preteen or a teen and we make recommendations. Um, uh, pretty much like not exactly the way that Ryan was saying, but we don't get into the, the actual details of saying, hey, if this is the age of your child. These are the platforms that we recommend uh, that you give them access. These are the ones we don't do not recommend uh, you give them access. So we 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 let them look and so we actually and we show them the concept. Hey, by by choosing this profile, this is what you can expect that your child will be um, uh, will be using. And most most parents actually prefer that. Like I said, yes, they do care, but it's if it gets too complicated, they'll just abandon it. So if we can make some simple recommendations, saying, hey, based on your and on your child's age group, this is what we recommend. Typically, that's the option uh, that they go with. With and obviously, uh, platforms are evolving, services are evolving, new apps, new trends. So it's always an, an experience that we're always curating, always making sure that okay, we, we've we've dated, we know the trends, we know what what's being what's more popular, what's what's actually fallen uh, fallen out of the of the preferences, so we can keep those recommendations fresh and actually get parents to engage back once we say, hey, these were the recommendations we made. This is actually how your child uh, is using. And yes, it does match or no. So we probably want to make some adjustments. Uh, but usually we we try to curate the experience of the, re of the recommendations based on, on the on the age of the, um, uh, of the child and just make it easier for parents to make those, th those decisions. That's great, thank you. Um, and thank you also for fixing uh, any audio problems, Marco. We're hearing you loud and clear and it's great. Um, and I also did wanna remind people to send in any questions. Uh, I've seen a lot of people have been chatting, which is great. We have a very wide ranging uh, audience here from uh, teachers and school professionals to uh, tech companies and technologists to NGOs and Nick Mick. So please everyone send your questions in and I'm gonna call out uh, Carissa Kang with an excellent question. I was gonna ask about sort of the developmental stages of kids and how you design controls for them, products for them, and or parental controls. And she beat me to it by asking, how should we think about parental controls for older kids, preteens or older teens, without overstepping older kids' privacy concerns? Actually, this is something that we debate 
uh, our, ourselves uh, a lot in how we take the the, 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 direct, the direction we take for our products. So even though some things, even though technology allows you to do it, it doesn't mean that you necessarily should do it. And there's always a market for parental for the um, the helicopter type parental control parental control type apparently wants to see everything, but our research has shown that this is absolutely counterproductive especially when you get into these age groups, the preteens and the teens. Um, and actually, parents are starting to, to, to realize that uh, as well. Uh, the, the, uh, I remember one of, one of our last, um, uh, one of our, you know, one of our last uh, researches, we actually, it, it was a really high number, so almost 70% of parents, they understood that if they were too intrusive, it would mean a lack of trust in their children. And this would completely, break not only just that the fact that they were trying to use parental controls wouldn't work at all but it could actually damage their relationship with their children because they were signaling a, a lack of um, a lack of trust so one of the ways that we've been addressing this and i was talking about this um uh, previously is about the transparency do not make it too intrusive provide so, just some level high level perspective of the parents saying hey this is what your child is doing and tell the child exactly what you're sharing with the parents the the, the transparency really is here the key and is what enables the, the the dialogue so if you're telling the parent hey this is how much time your your uh, children are spending on these platforms tell the child the same thing let the child figure out by themselves hey maybe i'm using too much or maybe i'm i'm seeing things that i shouldn't but usually the less as children age the less restrictive you are actually the better parental controls work where and you really move into that values based type of parenting parent where you're monitoring from a high level and you're having conversations instead of setting restrictions and invading on their privacy and being too intrusive which clearly just completely breaks uh, and but that's what we figure out through 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 our research yeah and you know, i think the research uh, the fozy research has shown over the past year that there is this trend especially once you get past that you know 7 to 11 age and you start getting you know into the 12 plus and the teenage years that the trend is towards more agency and control for kids especially teenagers and that builds a lot of trust and positive engagement uh, with uh, parents and caregivers um, versus the traditional, as, as Marco was saying, you know, the overarching restrictive controls and the whole kind of, you know, surveillance state of, of maybe, you know, the past, because that's how we traditionally ran security controls in a corporate environment is, you know, you have restrictive policies and you lock everything down. But uh, we've learned, I think, over the years that it's, you know, dealing with humans is a little bit different. And, and so I think agency and control is a, is a core theme. Um, a, a couple examples, maybe, to, uh, you know, to bring this back to industry, um, you know, we're seeing more and more with um, the uh, the cell phone providers and you know the Google, Apple, Microsofts of the world, where there's asked to buy functionality. So you may have a child account that's attached to a family account. The the um, child can still ask to buy an app, and then you approve it. But there's a lot less friction um, in that uh, engagement. And you, as the parent, um, are aware of you know what the child is doing. You can read the reviews um, you, before you approve it. And then there's another example in uh, one of the panels from last year where Microsoft uh, had, had said that you may have a child that's playing a game and they want to play uh, with um, their friend or just another profile. They, as a child, the restrictions, they can't just add another profile, but then they can request that the parent approve it. And so then the parent has the opportunity to review that profile and, and um, approve it that way. So there's more engagement and less friction agency and control, I think that's the theme we're going to see throughout. And so the trick is, uh, from industry perspective, how do we build our products so that we enable that engagement between um, children uh, and parents, especially in the teenage years? Yeah, it's um, not to, to sort of just pile on with the same a similar response, but to the, the thing I think everyone here understands, um, in many of these cases, particularly as you reach those teen years, um, the, the kids are very likely more technically sophisticated than their parents and so you, you, like we've seen so many cases of um you know cases where kids will like unplug the parental control device that happens to be in their house or they know the router password so they go in and they change the controls um fostering those communications so that um you're not relying on 
that helicopter full visibility parenting. Um, we've seen, we've even seen situations where, um, you know, school age kids are using VPNs to route around their local school networking controls the same way. I'm sure Tom's used to some of his, um, his employees trying to route around some of the controls that they put in place. Um, it, it's, we've got to build these relationships and build trust and it's a hard, and I don't know that there's like a, a, a perfect answer, but I know the answer isn't, more controls on the children like you as they grow older and they're more technically sophisticated they're going to outthink any creation we put in place and so we've got to reach being comfortable with giving them some latitude to make good choices and hopefully that we raise them you know to that point of being savvy internet citizens so they can make those good choices Yeah, and I just add that parenting styles ultimately will still matter, right? Um, and they can be different. I, I certainly um, had a lot of restrictions um, around certain types of content well into my teenage years. So, you know, it, it really is in the parents' hands to a, to a large extent what they feel is appropriate uh, for their kids to watch and when. Um, you know, we've, we've had parents come to us saying like, hey, like I want my kid to watch stuff that's above uh, MA14. Right. Um, and so how do I do that? And it's like, well, there are up there. That's why we create these custom tools. Um, you have the ability to watch together. Um, if you want to have conversations with your kids about content themes that are more mature to them, that's all um, you know, well within your your ability to do. Um, we do at the same time have um, you know differentiated experiences for younger kids um, and older kids. For example, we've got a dedicated kids profile um, which serves up content that's broadly for 12 years and below, um, and designed in a very you know, with a very simplified look and feel. And it's it's clear it's a controlled experience. Um, so we we do also factor those things into the design and then at the end of the day um, giving parents the tools to set the age level for each profile um, according to the levels they're most comfortable with excellent thank you and and as we're winding down in these last 13 or so minutes here please definitely keep the questions coming i see another one or two so we'll try to get to those um and then while i have you and we were mentioning uh tom mentioned our FOSI research last year uh, multiple speakers today have already touched on parental controls and user controls. So this morning, as many of you know, we released our new research into Gen Z's use of technology and online safety tools. One of the findings shows that 56% of Gen Z social media users were aware of any safety tools within their online platforms that they were using, while 44% were not aware of any safety tools. Is that surprising to you? Is that I'm guessing not based on what we've talked about today and some of the difficulties of reaching these people? Uh, are there, how do we increase user awareness? Is this a big media literacy opportunity that we're all gonna seize? I saw some nodding from Tom. <laughs> Well, I, well, I was thinking about it from a product perspective um, rather than, uh, you know, a controls for parents. But, you know, in general, when, when I think about um, products, you know, toy products that we make, um, we really need to think about privacy and security, not in the traditional sense, like building software, you know, where you're thinking about data in terms of, you know, confidentiality, integrity and availability, but really thinking about it from a safety paradigm. So, you know, you look at you look at like automobiles, for example, cars used to not have seat belts, you know, or anti-lock brakes or airbags, but now they do um, because it's built in as part of the car because it's a core safety feature. And similarly, there's other features, you know, if, if the car is not in park, you can't start the engine. Um, you know, there's there's the uh, infotainment lockout, you know, et cetera. And I think um, having good defaults, thinking about it from a, a safety perspective is how all toys um, should be built. And that's the approach that we take at Mattel as well. We want good uh, out of the box defaults wherever possible. Now I know, you know some products are um, you know, more complicated than others. So you know, one size doesn't fit all, but as a starting point, I think um, having good uh, defaults for um, safety, for security, for privacy makes sense. And then, so you know, getting back to the Gen Z research, uh, you know, some of the research has um, shown that the, the the Gen Zs and and the and the millennials uh, tend to um, trust in the system. So if uh, if they trust in the system, and we can infer that they trust the products that are being created to make good decisions, you know, on their behalf where relevant, then I want to make sure that the products have good defaults out of the box. I think what's interesting on that data point is. Um, 
and it, and it sort of aligns with what Tom's saying. It, it's not so much that, that the, the awareness factor is not terribly surprising. I, I think if you drive a level deeper, what, what's also probably interesting is, is what, again, with Tom's trust the system, what do they think those controls do? And I think a, a place where people are not terribly well educated, at, regardless of age or generation, is the fact that um, their security, their privacy, their data, the, the, the data about them is used in many, many, many different ways. And some of that's controllable via security controls. And some of that is not, it's just something you're, you're sort of trading for the convenience of using a particular tool or service. And um, I, I think one of the things we're seeing already in our consumers, and as we go out and talk to prospective customers is uh, that growing awareness, particularly um, informed by, you know, the, the news of the past four or six weeks, the growing awareness that we do trade, you know, a lot of our own data for the tools we use. Um, and we don't understand the risk both to our, um, what happens with that data, but also physically to ourselves. There is physical risk for leaking that data. There is a uh, material financial risk for leaking that data. That, that end of not just that their awareness of those tools, but awareness of what those security and privacy controls can um, manage is something that I think we are just uh, have not evolved a user base, a consumer base sophisticated enough to really understand all the ways their their data and privacy is exploited. Yeah, not not just by one on what Ryan was saying, but I was thinking about exactly the same thing. The, the awareness does not surprise me uh, at all. And that also indicates that some of those companies probably are not being as proactive in sharing those as uh, those controls as they would, because obviously it's bad. It's probably bad for business for them. But I think the most important part is really we still see a lot of um, we, we we don't see enough uh, education on users to understand what are the the impacts and the consequences of not making those privacy or security decisions. People really don't understand what they might be exposing themselves uh, to by not setting those. Uh, what, what makes make makes me wonder even even if some of those controls were more visible, maybe people still wouldn't wouldn't uh, pay as much attention. Probably what we do need um, is some way, and I, I don't know what the right answer is to that, but how do we educate every online user into saying, hey, these are the consequences of the, the, the decisions you make regarding your privacy and your security. This is what happens when you make data like this publicly available or when, when you don't take these precautions in, in protecting your either your identity or whatever is that, that you're um, uh, that you're sharing and that's really that that really is the, the next step because all of all of the all of the platforms do have those uh, tools whether they're uh, more transparent or more easily accessible than not but they, they all have them but the fact that people don't know is because they, they, they've never even they've never even understood what they might be exposing themselves to thank you i don't, I don't know if you wanted to go shanta i'm happy to I'll, I'll make it quick. I mean, I think for us, our, our key audience is really parents and adults because you need to have a credit card and be above 18 to sign up for Netflix to start with. Um, um, but, but you know, regardless, education is is the running theme, right? Whichever audience group uh, you're looking at. And so, so of course, just reinforcing what, what we've already all talked about. We need to be doing more together to help support that education. Um, simplifying the experience with our parental control so that it's easy and intuitive. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll end with the seven steps of digital parenting that POSI has, has championed that is, is more critical than ever. Always love a plug for our products. Uh, free online at POSI.org. Uh, the seven digital steps, as seven good steps for digital parenting, as well as other tools that uh, Shanta is very familiar with. Anyone can get those. Um, I think we're going to end on a quick uh, lightning round for each person. But right before that, we'll, we've had a lot of consensus so far. So maybe this one will have some different answers given how different each of your companies are. What do you see right now as the biggest threat to online safety? Well, here, I'll, I'll jump in and say I'm going to reiterate what I said in my last, my last response. I think... Um, uh, d data privacy, like um, we've, I, I sort of harken back to that ne negative externality. I, I don't think we we understood what we were creating 
two decades ago in building a big, almost an economy built off of access to sort of almost unfettered access to, to personal data. And as, um, as that shifts, as people become more aware, more cognizant of the trade-offs they're making, um, it's leading to really interesting decision points. Um, but we grow in a generation of, of, of children and even now adults who, who just don't necessarily see the risk and re-educating a population to, to the risk is really hard. I mean, you've got um, one of the wealthiest, richest companies in, in the world, Apple, trying to educate a customer base on, on privacy, um, both as their own value prop, but also for what they think is, is um, may, maybe good for, for consumers. It's a really challenging problem. And even on our own products, we want to make things more personal. How do you make things more personal? You need to know more about the user. There's a really fine line to walk there in terms of the data you capture, what you do with it. Tom alluded to capturing data, then immediately throwing it away. This story is like is is in is in the introduction. It's in it's it's in nascency. Um, and over the next you know decade, I think we're gonna really um, reckon with the impact on on data and data privacy uh, and how it's impacted sort of all of our lives and will continue to impact our lives. Yeah, I, I see two biggest risks. Um, you know, uh, one on the technical side is just bad software, and you know, not everyone is experienced building smart toys or connected toys or connected smart toys, and so they're going to make mistakes. They're going to enable firmware updates without adding the extra safety precaution that you need to acknowledge it physically on the device. So there's no way uh, an attacker, you know, outside um, physical access can uh, do something to that device. So there's going to be a lot of new products um, that hit the market and they may not have learned uh, how to build products securely. So I think industry can uh, certainly help there. And then the second uh, threat, I think, to online safety in general is um, not a technical threat, but I think it's, it's a social one. And that is we need to make sure that um, you know, the products and the content that we produce is uh, culturally relevant because I think it's easy for us to think about, you know, our perspectives, um, but there are a lot of other perspectives out there. And we're seeing industry build products and content across multiple demographics, uh, multiple um, different perspectives. And I think that's a great change. Yeah, from, from my perspective, I'd say probably one of the biggest threats, and when, especially when it relates to, to children, is probably the, the lack of parenting, parental investment in the online education. Uh, we can build great software, we can build uh, great tools, but if parents expects, expect that a tool solves all the problems without any investment, it's hardly ever um, uh, going to work. And we understand it's difficult, it's difficult for parents to manage, so that's why we build tools that help them manage. But um, we also need to educate parents in a way saying, hey, online education is just like any other type of education. It does require time and investment. It does require that you're vest It does require that you talk to your children um, uh, about it. So as much as our tools help parents set some control, we also need to, to make sure that parents understand what are the challenges and provide them the, 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 the necessary means to educate their children. So if parents disinvest and expect a tool to solve the problems, tools don't solve problems. Tools are just uh, tools are just something you use to solve uh, the, the the problem. I think that's probably one of the the biggest um, uh, risks we we should be managing right now. Yeah, and 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 agreeing with all that, I think I think you know members or, or, or users really have a diverse set of needs and expectations. So how we will find solutions that can meet those diverse needs. Um, and, and there's a lot more than we need to learn about that space, right? Um, and, and also, how do we also communicate the risks and concerns across different services? Because there are so many different services on the internet and the risk is not equal, um, you know? So helping parents navigate that space. And, and ultimately, I think, I, I think the risk also is us as service providers not keeping a close pulse on the needs of our members. So always um, staying close and true to that would be really important. Excellent. So I know those were uh, more of a negative question, but I appreciate the uh, way you viewed it as opportunities. And then with the very last final question, just a couple seconds, uh, there any, what's one takeaway that you want the audience to take from this conversation today, either about your company, your tools, your products, or something else we've already discussed? I'll go quick. Uh, you know, number one rule for building products securely: if you don't save data, the attacker can't steal your data. Excellent. Uh, 
uh, I think parenting online is hard. Um, and, and so choosing simplicity whenever possible, just making choices, just make a choice can help make it better. Um, this, it can be overwhelming. Don't let that actually be a, a, a detractor. Don't let that stop you from, from making some choices to start to make it a little bit, a little bit easier for yourself. I think um, we all need to get together and work on that one-stop shop solution to help empower parents on how to use parental controls as effectively as they can. And I'll, I'll just reinforce something we talked about before. If you're using parental controls to manage your children's online activity, make sure you're also talking to them at the same time, not just setting rules and uh, uh, and, and restrictions and not having the, 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 the conversation that goes along with it. I love it. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Uh, thank you to our attendees for joining this session and keeping the chat pretty active and asking a couple questions. And especially thank you to each of you, Ryan, Tom, Shanta, and Marco. Really appreciate the conversation today. I believe next up is a networking break and uh, expo booth exploration before the next session starts at 145 Eastern, so just under 30 minutes. Thank you again so much for helping us out today and hope you have a great rest of the day. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Bye. Bye.